All right. Good morning, Bagby parents. Um, welcome to the September 15th Principal's Coffee, our first of the year and first virtual Principal's Coffee. Thank you for, for joining me this morning. Um, this is going to be an opportunity for me to kind of review some of the different updates that um, I've shared out with the community over the past few weeks, along with some of the updates from Dr. Andrews, and also to kind of discuss some of um, the next steps that steps, excuse me, that um, we likely will be um, seeing, um, hopefully, over the upcoming um, next few weeks, as we um, hopefully as public health issues, public health conditions allow us to transition to kind of our next phase for the school year. So again, I'm Michael Kretsch. For any of you who don't know me, I see a lot of familiar names. So. Um, Welcome again. Uh, this is my second year as principal here at Bagby, and I'm also the, the proud parent of a kindergartner um, here at Bagby as well. So I know very, very um, acutely uh, the experience of parenting during distance learning and its particular pitfalls and challenges, but also um, have seen firsthand how our teachers have kind of risen to the occasion to make sure that they're, they're best supporting kids. So um, welcome again. So today's agenda, what I'm hoping to kind of cover um, is a framework called MTSS, um, kind of overview, give you guys all an overview, which I've done um, last year to kind of discuss um, what exactly that framework is, how does it apply in distance learning, how will it apply in a hybrid model if we're able to return, um, discussing some of the assessments that your students are taking at the beginning part of the school year and why they're so important, and just walking through some of the um, uh, steps that you as families might need to take in order to best support your kids successful completion of those assessments. We're going to also discuss some of the public health conditions and how they've shifted um, over the past few weeks and the implications for those shifting public health conditions on our next phases in terms of the 2021 school year. Um, I've received a lot of questions in regards to the waiver process and what exactly that means and I want to kind of clear up some of the details around that based on the information that Dr. Um, Andrew shared out um, last week. And then I also, in anticipation that um, at some point during the school year, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll be able to make the next big transition to a hybrid model and just kind of reviewing exactly what the hybrid model means for families and how as a staff will go about determining where students will be assigned in our AMPM model. Um, and then at the end, I want to be able to take some questions. It, it appears that we're going to have a small enough group today um, that I'll be able to respond to people's questions. Um, if for some reason we get inundated with a large number, I might just turn on the chat feature and utilize that for kind of streamlining um, communication. But um, since we only have, it looks like 12 or 13 participants this morning, um, I think we can uh, just do it the, the old traditional way. So um, welcome again. And uh, we'll first talk, talk about MTSS. S. So MTSSS is a basically stands for multi-tiered systems of support. Um, this is a framework that schools utilize um, across um, the state, but um, has been implemented across the, the country for a number of years um, in different school districts. And really the, the, the point behind it is um, structuring and building out a framework for student supports, um, but not just necessarily for the students um, who acutely need additional supports, but making sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students. So um, as you can see, there's kind of three different tiers. And the idea behind the different tiers is that some of the some of the different supports are applied to every single one of our students. Some of them are applied to smaller groups. And then some of them are applied to individuals based on specific needs. So in terms of our tier one supports, we have our positive behavior intervention system or PBIS. And we're attempting um, to continue on with those uh, supports for all of our students, even in distance learning. And we're gonna be kind of a meeting with a our PBIS team tomorrow to kind of strategize on how we can kind of keep our positive behavior intervention system going um, in a distance model and a distance learning model and also in a hybrid model in anticipation for that. So that includes our, our Bagby Bravos, um, our monthly, monthly principal awards. Um, we're also working to 
um, make sure that uh, our project cornerstone classroom volunteers are able to still come in, even in a virtual sense, to your child's classrooms to read particular books and um, kind of guide students through particular lessons related um, to social emotional well being and interacting in a positive way with one another. Um, and then also we have a SEL specific curriculum called Second Step that all of your students should be receiving weekly lessons at this point. And, and those lessons will continue for about three quarters of the year. It's built to be approximately like a 26, 28 week um, curriculum. So weekly your child will be receiving uh, Second Step lessons from their specific teachers. And the whole idea behind Second Step is that there, we're making sure that we're meeting meeting their needs in terms of social emotional development and in particular given the degree to which there's been a lot of change um, over the past seven months for for all of us but in particular for our students that we're making sure that we're supporting those needs at this point um, additionally your your teachers in the past week if they haven't already will be very soon starting to give your child um, universal screeners in english language arts and math um, and also social emotional um, needs. Um, so those those are three different screeners that our students um, second through five grade will be taking. Um, and then our younger students, their teachers might not be giving them the, the exact same universal screeners, but I know that our kinder and TK teams completed assessments over the first two and a half, three weeks of school, um, including the ESGI assessment. The really the important part about those universal screeners is that we're identifying the specific needs of every kid and that based off of that foundational information, information, excuse me, teachers can begin to build strategic small groups so that um, what we found is that in distance learning, it's really important that teachers um, structure their instruction um, to small groups of students. Um, large group instruction works for particular things, but in terms of really making sure that they're able to best identify through this virtual format of, of teaching, um, small groups approximately six students or so is seems to be the ideal cohort size or group size. And so we want to make sure that through the universal screeners, teachers are able to identify the needs of your kids and then best structure their groups that they're participating in so that instruction is very impactful. Um, again, our core curriculums, we have core curriculums in ELA and math. So our ELA curriculum is Benchmark Advance and our math curriculum is uh, Eureka. And um, we also are going to continue to have ongoing PDs. So every Wednesday, our teachers have time for professional development <clears throat> and collaboration time. And the focus of our professional development and collaboration time as a staff um, over the next couple weeks um, as we continue distance learning are going to continue to be on ed tech and making sure that teachers have the tools and know how to use the tools most effectively to support distance learning making sure that we're continuing with our implementation. We're in year two now of our benchmark advanced implementation. So focusing on that. And then also making sure that we're meeting the needs of our um, students in terms of their um, social emotional support. So making sure that those second step lessons are being taught effectively. Um, tier two, as you can kind of see, is more specifically targeted to small groups of students who have particular identified needs. And so out of our universal screeners, we will tar start to uh, uh, determine some strategic small groups that may need some additional support services um, through our intervention and reading math pullout um, system. Um, and so I'm actually <clears throat> have a meeting today as a district where we're trying to determine how best to um, support intervention needs um, in a distance format. Um, and in a typical year, these small group of students would be identified in six to eight week cycles. They would go and work with either our math or our reading intervention teacher um, for uh, 30 to 45 minute daily sessions. Um, and then after the six to eight week cycle, they would be reevaluated. And if they had made appropriate growth, that time would be then spent back in their general education classroom instead of being pulled out. So we're currently working right now to kind of try to identify how can we support those students who need a little bit of extra help, but in a distance learning format? Um, we also <clears throat> are fortunate enough to have a counselor joining us for two days a week this year. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, last year for those parents um, who were with us last year, I think you'll recall that we kind of had a challenging year in terms of uh, counseling support. We 
we had um, a support organization that the district partnered with um, who struggled to hire a counselor for us for a number of months. And then once we had that individual, she was with us for, I believe, about six weeks before she accepted another job um, elsewhere within the county. Um, and so that really put us at a deficit in terms of making sure that we were meeting the needs of a particular um, subgroup of our students. Um, I'm hopeful that this year, given that we already have the person in place, um, I've already met with them um, a few different times, and the next step is identifying based on not only our universal screeners, but also information, um, anecdotal information from both, from both parents and, and also teachers um, in these first few weeks about how we go about strategically identifying um, which students need those support services at this time. Um, un unfortunately, I mean, the, the reality is, is that the, our counseling support is limited. Um, our counselor only is currently assigned to us for two days a week um, and only has a particular capacity in terms of seeing students in a thoughtful manner. We wanna make sure that um, teachers are, excuse me, not teachers, um, the counselor is able to be effective with these students and so we don't necessarily want to overburden her caseload to the point where she's only able to have five minute check-ins with a very large number of kids but we're attempting to find the appropriate balance where she's strategically structuring um, some of her support services um, in small groups where she'll be meeting with some students who have similar um, needs areas of need um, and also with individual check-in on an individual check-in basis. So um, that's what we're currently working on right now is attempting to make some strategic decisions um, that balance her capacity to meet with students during the course of the week with also making sure that we're meeting kids' needs effectively. So that, that balance between the group structure and the individual counseling. Um, and then all the way up to tier three, those are more of the individual supports that we, we offer. Um, a lot of them have to do with potentially having a check-in check-out with a particular um, known adult here on campus. Oftentimes what we utilize in a traditional school year um, for students who are kind of struggling to make positive decisions um, or just kind of need a little bit of extra help is a check-in check-out and in that process a particular known adult would be assigned to that to check in daily with a particular student um, just to see how the kind of the, the day is gone, what worked well, what didn't, and how we can improve for the next day. And so right now I'm working with our PBIS team to kind of figure out how we can continue to, to keep that system going in, in, a virtual, in a virtual format. So that is the MTSS systems of support. Um, and again, kind of the, the, the work that has had to go into the beginning part of the year is identifying where these or how these different system, this system of support can continue given our, our virtual interface with students. So assessments, as I shared with you, um, it's super important that your children are completing these universal screeners in math, ELA, and SEL. The whole point is to be making data-driven strategic small instructional groups. As you all know, it's far more effective to be sitting on a Zoom call with a small group um, as opposed to a large, a large, large group of students. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is take the data from these assessments. Um, and make sure that it's impactful in terms of your, your child's teachers' um, strategic small groups that they build. As I shared out in my um, Friday message, how can you help? Well, one of the challenges for um, typically in, a, in a, a last year, our teachers were directly able to supervise how these assessments were, were given. Um, and so what we want to make sure that given this virtual setting, in particular for our, our youngest kids, some of them are struggling to log in. So your teachers might have sent out um, a video from Mr. Matt Hill, um, and it was also included in my, my banner message last Friday. So I just want to show it briefly to you in case any of you have young kids and you're struggling to figure out how to actually get them onto these universal screeners. Hello, this video um, is intended to help you log in to get access to the FastBridge uh, reading and math test that your teacher um, is asking you to take. So the first thing you wanna do is log into Clever. So if you're not logged into Clever, you're gonna go to the Clever um, login page, log in with Google. And I'm gonna log in as a student today so you can see what it looks like. 
Okay. And once you're logged into uh, Clever, you want to go down to the section that says links, L-I-N-K-S, right here. And you're going to choose the, uh, the icon that says Illuminate Education, this guy right here. So I'm going to click on that. That's going to ask me to sign in again. So I'm going to click on the red Sign In with Google button, this guy right here. And again, uh, you're going to sign in as yourself. I have a couple users, so you may not see this screen, but if you do, just pick yourself. And when you get here, it's going to give you two choices, a blue continue to portal button and a green take assessment button. But you want to choose the blue button right now, the continue to portal. Now, if you're on an iPad, you won't at first see this black menu bar here on the left, this guy right here. But if you, um, just click on these three uh, horizontal lines. It will open up that menu for you. You can click on, uh, then you're going to click on Fast Bridge Learning right here. And that will take you to the assessments that your teacher has assigned. So there's reading, math, and something called My Savers, which um, really just helps us understand how you're feeling about things right now. And you want to just take the tests that your teacher has assigned. So if your teacher didn't say take all of them, just take the ones that have been assigned by your teacher. I hope this helps. Have a great day. So again, the, the biggest challenge in, in these assessments um, and where you can kind of step in and support your kid if you have a young child is helping with that login procedure. As you can see, it utilizes our Google Suite single sign-in. Um, it is, does require a few extra clicks that might typically um, your, your kindergarten or first grader might be used to, um, but if you can just kind of help guide them in making sure that uh, they can get in and take those assessments. And one of the really, really important things that I, I can't reiterate enough is making sure that once your kid actually starts the assessment that you step away. The goal behind these assessments is to actually determine what your child's needs are and if you are uh, are directly assisting your child with their responses, you're potentially gonna skew their data. And really what we wanna make sure is that we're not only encouraging their independence, but that teachers have an accurate um, data set to kind of base strategic decisions on in terms of those building of those strategic small groups. And if unfortunately, um, if uh, a parent has intervened in making sure that their student gets all the answers correctly, they might not get the, the, the level of support that they actually might need. So. Please, once your child is signed on, step away. I know it can be difficult sometimes, but make sure that you're stepping away and actually allowing them to take the assessment so that the, the information that we receive as a school is as accurate as possible. So Dr. Andrews um, on the 8th of September shared a message um, kind of discussing what, um, what the conditions, public health conditions were um, as of early September and kind of what our next steps and, and she attempted to clarify um, some things. So I'd like to reshare that with you if you haven't, haven't happened to see it yet. Hello, Cambrian community. Welcome to the beginning of the 2020-21 school year. With distance learning in full effect, our teachers and staff are working extremely hard to provide our students and families with the overarching support to maximize student learning from the current format. Recently, the California Department of Public Health unveiled new guidelines that may allow us to bring small groups of students to provide limited instruction and facilitation only for a specialized subset of children. We're also applying for an elementary school waiver that may allow for in-person instruction for small groups of students. Although optimistic news, the existence of the guidelines and waiver is not a guarantee that we will be able to return to campus, as each has its own challenges and ever-shifting requirements that must be met. And once met, we would still need to be approved by both the Santa Clara County Public Health Department and the California Department of Public Health. We are doing everything possible to respond to ever-changing guidelines However, I want to be open and transparent and tell you this will not be an immediate process. As information continues to evolve, you have my commitment and I will keep you updated. I know that this is not the beginning of the school year we had all envisioned. The truth is that none of us knows what lies ahead, 
but we face this uncertainty together. I look forward to the day when we have all of this in our rear view mirror so we can see our amazing students again in person. Until that day comes, please take care of yourselves and each other and know that Cambrian School District is making every effort to serve your family, teach your children, and make them thrive, even during a pandemic. We're not slowing down because our students deserve nothing but our absolute best. We are Cambrian. So one, one thing that Dr. Andrews um, mentioned was the voucher and that the district intends to continue to move forward with the voucher. One thing that just kind of needs to be clarified about the voucher is that the voucher application doesn't allow for just a blanket reopening um, in full capacity of schools. Um, our neighboring districts um, who have applied and have been approved through the voucher process are bringing only targeted small groups of students back at this time. I think that's been kind of a misconception that's been out there that if districts were only to apply and get approved, then all kids can come back. And the reality is, is that those districts who applied for the voucher have only brought targeted small groups back at this time. Um, those kids needing the specific supports that only in school um, support can really provide. So if you guys um, saw Dr. Andrew's message from last Friday, um, there was this grid that kind of summarizes the um, California tiered reopening um, system with uh, where it kind of correlates widespread infection and positivity test, right, test rates um, to uh, different tiers. And so previously Santa Clara County was in the widespread tier one. And if as a school district, your county is in um, that tiered designation, um, you're unable to open with any in-person instruction or support. Um, just last week, Santa Clara's numbers were updated and it's reflective of us being in um, a substantial community disease transmission um, with positivity rates being between five and 8%. This change in, in the tier designation um, allows for schools to, to start to reopen um, for some students in a very, very strategic way. So I kind of want to walk through what the next couple weeks um, might look like um, if we continue to see a progression in terms of a, a decrease or a stabilization in test positivity rates. So as I just said, um, last week, Santa Clara County went from tier one to tier two, the purple to the red band because of positivity rates dropping um, throughout the county over the past three weeks. So what is currently happening as a result within Cambrian School District? So beginning next week, um, as a district, we're gonna start bringing targeted specialized services back to campus. Um, and this will only be for students who are receiving special education assessments. So, there are students who have been um, in process of either being evaluated for the first time or reevaluated for special education services. And part of that process includes a battery of assessments that need to be given by school psychologists, um, SDC or RSP teachers, occupational therapists and speech therapists. And so as a result, um, we need to be able to conduct these assessments. So because of the shift from tier one to tier two, we are now going to be able to restart the process of assessing students here and utilizing school facilities to do that on a one-to-one -one basis. So these students will be brought to campus, will be taken to strategic identified rooms within campus, um, utilize particular tables um, that have been sanitized and only be interacting with one additional staff member during um, each individual testing ses session. So that is one change that is taking place currently is we're, we have planned for, have those rooms set up and ready to go. And as soon as our special education support staff need um, to start those assessments, they'll be able to do that um, as soon as beginning next week. In the upcoming few weeks, kind of dependent on public health conditions, um, there's a possibility that we might start, as Dr. Andrews shared in her Friday updates, 
small targeted cohorts of students back to campus. So this potentially could be students who have special education service services that would best be provided in the most effective manner here on campus um, in on a one to one basis um, or in very, very small cohorts um, or also to potentially facilitate distance learning for some of our students who, for a variety of reasons, have really struggled to engage um, in distance learning. We want to make sure that we're um, meeting all students needs equitably and so we're also looking at our trends in terms of student participation rates over the spring and also during the first four weeks of this school year to identify if there are some students who because of a variety of different barriers are struggling to fully engage in distance learning and if we potentially can bring them back to campus in cohorts to be supervised for distance learning but potentially eliminating some of the barriers that they might um, have been facing by attempting to engage in distance learning from home. So that's what we're kind of looking at for the next, next few weeks. So if Santa Clara County is able to maintain some sense of stability in terms of positivity rates um, in um, the, the time period, the 14 days between the 8th of September and the 22nd of September, meaning we've remained in the red tier or even moved beyond that um, into the, the lower tiers, then what we'll start looking into is the possibility of a phased in reopening um, for in-person instruction. Um, you as families will be given at minimum two weeks advance notice of our intent to start bringing back general education students to school for in-person instruction. And as Dr. Andrews laid out in her Friday uh, update to the community, um, the first phase would likely begin um, if we continue to trend in the right direction um, with the first phase starting sometime in mid-October. Um, and by the Thanksgiving break, hopefully having all of our TK through five students um, back on campus. And kind of what we're thinking is that it makes the most sense for our students who have the least familiarity with school, um, the physical campus, its facilities, to bring them back first. Um, they also are the ones who, um, the model of distance learning is in particular very, very challenging for our youngest students and their families. So we want to make sure that we're bringing them back with adequate time to get comfortable with coming back to school um, in a physical Sorry, my watch is talking to me. Um, to bring them back in a phased approach. So we would likely start with our PK um, or here at Bagby, our TKers through our first graders in our first wave. Um, and then a few weeks later, our second and third graders, and then followed up by our fourth and fifth graders um, at a later date. So as has been shared out by the, the district previously, um, instruction would follow a hybrid model. We, we still need to have the hybrid model because um, the, the tiers don't allow us to bring back every single kid um, into campus because we also have to make sure that we're meeting public health guidelines. And those public health guidelines dictate that we follow a cohort model. So we can't have a certain number of students in the same space. We need to make sure that we're maintaining social distancing students will be need to be wearing masks, um, but the model that we'll be implementing is an AMPM or a cohort model, which the district shared out in previous documentation early in the year. So um, it largely would follow an AMPM schedule with instruction starting for our A group um, at 815 um, with students then transitioning off of campus um, later in the day and then we would be bringing in the second group of students for the second half of the day um, and there would be adequate time for transitions so we would have to at Bagby would have to utilize multiple entrances in hopes of minimizing any cross path um, interactions between our different cohorts our AM and our PM um, and so we might end up utilizing very strategic gates for different groups of students at different times of the day and then at the end of the day, as families come, or at the end of each um, wave uh, or cohort, we would have to have strategic locations for families to greet their, their students and pick them up and make sure that we're maintaining um, cohort integrity so that there's not necessarily um, students interacting with one another across different cohorts. Um, in terms of how we go about identifying which students are assigned to which cohort. 
So the, the first filter and something that I've already started work with our special education team in anticipation of a shift in model um, is we need to make sure that we've identified our support providers capacity to be able to provide their legally mandated minutes to our students who are receiving special education services. So at first, the first students who will be signed to either an AM or a PM cohort will be our students who have IEPs because we need to make sure that those supports providers can actually provide the minutes. And it's actually kind of a more logistical question um, because they can't have all of their students in the morning cohort. Um, and then second, we definitely will be considering siblings. We don't want to overburden families with the possibility of having one student in the AM um, cohort um, and then dealing with childcare for another student in the morning, but then also having a student in the PM cohort and having to deal with childcare at that time. So we are going to be first looking at our special education students, making sure that we're strategically scheduling them for our service providers. Um, and then secondly, looking at making sure that we're scheduling siblings into the same cohort. And we're gonna do our best, but as you guys can all likely imagine, the, the logistics around um, taking our uh, 377 some students that we have um, in the hybrid model this year and scheduling them is going to be quite a daunting task, but I think we're already well along the way in terms of planning it so that the decision can be made in the most equitable fashion as possible. So communication pledge, as I've kind of said all along during COVID-19 and um, our shift to distance learning in the spring and now um, I, I commit to keeping you all informed um, and given the evolving conditions, I want to make sure that I'm keeping you informed as often as I possibly can. So please make sure to be paying attention to our my weekly Bagby Banner messages. Um, from time to time, I might send out a specific email. Um, and oftentimes, if there is a specific email that's not necessarily attached to the banner, I'll also send a reminder SMS text message um, to that. Um, and sometimes I might also, in particular, as we start looking into shifting back, again, if conditions allow us to, to a hybrid model, developing some videos that kind of help families and students understand kind of the new process for coming to school um, in a hybrid model. As you guys can all imagine, it's gonna look very different than what it would have um, on a, in a traditional school year where you're able to uh, walk your kid through the gates and right over to their, their teacher's classroom and meet their classroom teacher at the door. Um, that won't be possible this year. Um, and so I, I, I pledge to make sure that I've given you clear and accurate information as up to date as possible based on the conditions, but then also making sure that the information is easily understandable to you. And so that might, might mean that I might produce some videos about the, the drop off and pick up procedures. And then Dr. Andrews has committed to updating um, the community uh, on a weekly basis in her Friday messages, um, if not more regularly as needed. Um, so please make sure that you're paying attention to your emails. Um, if you haven't updated your email and or phone number with um, our front office, please do. Um, those are the numbers that are put into our system that allow us to be able to send messages out to you and make sure that um, you're getting information on a, on a timely basis. So um, questions. So I'm going to try to pull this off. Um, give me one second. I am still kind of new to Zoom. I'm still kind of learning my way around it. I'm very familiar with Google Meet, but I want to make sure that I can see if I can um, allow you to share out. I wonder if some of the settings that the district has in place might prohibit some of that, but give me one second. For some reason, I'm only seeing only, only only one of you currently has video. So I'm wondering if there's some default setting that is unfortunately preventing me from Anybody can unmute themselves at any time if you want to do it that way. But That's if perfect. you're not sharing your screen, you can um, just go into. There we go. Perfect. 
Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for clarifying that because you're yeah. the only one I was I was seeing. And so I was afraid that other <laughs> I'm the only one brave enough to show you my face this morning. <laughs> I, I, I was I was afraid that other people were locked out and that the settings had been set up the wrong way. So I, thank you for clarifying that. Susan, I think you did have a question, correct? I do. Yeah. Um, so when the model goes back and the students with the greatest needs get to go back first, which totally makes sense, how will that look for the rest of the class? So if a class had four students with IEPs and those students get to go back first, what goes on with the other 20 students um, that wouldn't go back first? Yeah, super good question. So uh, the, the first cohort of kids that will be brought, brought back are our special day students. Um, and so th those students will be potentially brought back within the next few weeks as public health conditions kind of allow. Um, in terms of the the RSP students or the students who are receiving res uh, resource um, services, they wouldn't necessarily be brought back to campus because our support provider also needs to have the capacity to be able to provide those services. And so they likely would fall into being brought back um, with the general education wave because again, in, in this cohort model, we need to identify the kids who need it, but it also is restricted by the service provider's ability to actually meet the logistics of sub potentially supporting 50 or so students. Um, but yeah, there, there are some details to kind of work out in terms of what happens if some families choose, given that this seems to be potentially a little bit on the earlier side than some families might have preferred to come back, what it all looks like if some families choose to remain in the distance model. And that's something that the district is certainly considering. We're having those conversations on a leadership level, but we don't have the responses or the answers to exactly how we're gonna logistically do that. But it is a consideration for sure. Any other questions? You can just unmute yourself and you don't have to show your, your video if you don't want to, but I wanna make sure that we're, we're responsive to any questions you might have. And if you feel, if you would feel more comfortable just shooting me an email, feel free to do so. Um, I'm happy to follow up via email um, on a one-off basis as well. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us in this first, first Principles Coffee of the Year. And again, um, I'm always available to answer questions in particular during these times of change. Uh, we wanna make sure that um, your questions and concerns are uh, addressed in a prompt manner. So feel free to to reach out um, if and when you have a when you have a question. So thank you all for joining us and uh, have a great day. Take care.